Gracie Jiu Jitsu rocks. Welcome to the Gracie Jiu Jitsu Rocks podcast, a podcast dedicated to Gracie Jiu Jitsu and all things Gracie, including self defense, competition, anti bullying, women's self defense and empowerment nutrition, and most especially, the people involved in Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. This podcast is for the average Joe. It's for anyone who practices, trains, teaches, or just loves to talk about or hear about Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. We'll explore the lives of Gracie Jiu-Jitsu practitioners, how they got involved in the art, and what effect it's had on their lives. So buckle up and enjoy the ride. Welcome to episode 153 of the Gracie Jiu-Jitsu Rocks podcast. As always, I'm your host, Marty Josie, and thanks for listening. Today, my guest is Professor Ryan Young of Kama Jiu-Jitsu, and we'll get to that in just a moment, but before we do, let's do a quick quote, and that is, to do the right thing at the right time is a great art, and that's from Grandmaster Elio Gracie. All right, Professor Ryan Young is a third degree black belt under Master Dave Kama. He runs the Kama Jiu Jitsu Academy in the Dallas, Texas area, specifically in Flower Mound, Texas. He has an extensive martial arts background and is an amazing and interesting person. So I know you're going to enjoy this interview. After the interview, make sure you stick around for the Make a Difference, Make an Impact segment. And now, without further ado, Let's talk to Ryan. All right, so I am speaking with Professor Ryan Young of Kama Jiu Jitsu. So, welcome to the show, sir. Oh, thanks for having me. It's an honor and privilege, and I appreciate you being available. Oh, the privilege is mine. All right, a number of things I want to ask you about, but let's just kick it off by tell us tell us what's the most important thing jujitsu related that uh, you have going on right now. Well, we just moved our Flower Mound, Texas uh, campus into a bigger, better location. Um, we have three campuses: one in Irvine, California; one in Flower Mound, Texas, which is Dallas Fort Worth, and one in Austin, Texas. And the uh, the uh, let's see the. Irvine one is the oldest. That's one that I used to train at when I lived in California, and I moved to Texas in 2013. And we trained in a number of Taekwondo studios and karate studios, just kind of taking the time slots they didn't need or want, and they wanted to earn some extra money, so I just, you know, we paid. But um, this location we're in is our second uh, wholly, uh, wholly owned, not we don't own the building, but wholly owned location. And this one is basically our forever home or at least for the next five to ten years which is how the lease goes but um, we just moved into it that's the big thing and we're just uh, we're still finishing up the final details of the studio people ask how come i haven't done a walk around yet on the youtube video and and that's why there's a few things that we're finishing up but you know but that'll happen soon but this one's got we got three different mats we've got a weight room we've got an adult lounge a kid's lounge we've got three showers um it's it's pretty good stuff and um and, and I'm very grateful that uh, we've been able to get this done. It's just a matter of just uh, digesting it now. And that'll be, you know, that'll be our project for the next five years or so. And, uh, but that's really the big thing I'm working on right now. Uh, right now, this week, we have our um, annual Thanksgiving basket drive that we do every year for veterans or every year since 2014. Um, so it's just something that my family and our members um, in all three campuses have been participating in. And Master Dave Kama will be flying in this weekend. He and his wife Connie will be flying in this weekend to help with the effort, as they usually do. Um, and it's a it's a great thing for bringing our our studio together for for you know to do good because you know we we've all done well. You know we're we're all above ground, which is <laughs> it's a positive thing for me being being almost fifty five. And um, right. and it's awesome that we can do this for people uh, people who might be having a rough go at it in the current year. So that's what we're working on now. 
Awesome. And how, uh, well, I'm going to get into your, your journey in just a moment, but before I do, how, how was the move from California to, to Texas? Was there anything unexpected or do you pretty much how you thought it would be or what was that like? Well, you know, the funny thing is, um, um, you know, when somebody says, Hey, uh, you know, you're not from Texas, you know, you're from born and raised in Hawaii and then living in California 21 years. And I say, well, yeah, but I got here as quick as I could. Um, <laughs> Texas is awesome. I mean, it's not the state that is really awesome. It's the people that, that I come across mm. here. You could be walking and I uh, kind of, you know, you look at somebody in the eye, they always say, how you doing? Right, or they right. say hi. Whereas, you know, in Hawaii, you know, they, you look at them and, uh, you know, they may look at you and look away or they may look at you and stop and say, what are you looking at? Right. <laughs> um, and in California, they just kind of look the other way. If you say hi to them, they think you're weird and they keep right. walking. What's wrong with you? But in Texas, it's yeah. In Texas, it's not like that at all. Um, they're the most friendly people I know. Um, I was at Costco doing some shopping today and, you know, a gentleman next to me was throwing the stuff in the back of his car and he saw that I was, you know, finishing up and he says, I'll take your cart for you uh, when you're done. Nice. And I'm thinking, wow, what a nice thing to do. He says, I'm going there anyway. I'm thinking, I'm going there too. I was going to take yours, but but he went ahead and took the cart for me. And and you know, but that's just Texas, you know. And and it's 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 so awesome. And I, love I just Texas. love being here. Yeah, I yeah, I'm in North Carolina now, but I, I I'm in North Carolina, but I lived in three different places in Texas uh, years ago, and just loved. I was in San Antonio. El Paso and San Angelo. So really enjoy and yeah. just spend a little bit of time in the Dallas area. But but what you've just described reminds me of where I grew up in Florida, but up in the panhandle. So they call it, uh, low, they call it L.A., lower Alabama. And, yeah, uh, yeah. And uh, that's the way it is there. You know, people are just super friendly. They'll go out of their way to be nice to you. If you're driving down the road and someone passes you, they'll give you a nod or wave. You know, they don't know you. So I love stuff like that. It makes you feel, you know, great. Yeah, and you know it's, it's funny uh, you mentioned um, you know Lower Alabama, and uh, and where you are in North Carolina. I've never been to North Carolina, but that, you know I want to go. Uh, but I've been across the South, you know, as they call the Deep South, yes. and I've had nothing but great um, great times over there. I've met awesome people, and it's just like Texas, really, uh, to me at least. Yes, yes, and and that's why I love traveling through the South. I've done one, two, three, or four, three tours of different schools but primarily through the south um i did go up as uh you know i did go up into pennsylvania and ohio but primarily i like to kind of stay in the south only because i just love the people and the hospitality yeah yeah and i did see your video on uh your latest trip around the south and really enjoyed that yeah and i happened to visit a mutual friend of ours in uh randy mckelvey yes um, yes over in uh athens and uh yeah, and I, I always would refer to him as Professor Randy. How you doing, Professor? And he tell he corrected me last night and night last night night before. I said, "Uh, yeah, don't call me Professor." He goes, "I'd rather you call me Randy because that means you're my friend." I'm like, "Okay, uh, nice. I get it." <clears throat> so, well, we just had him up this this past weekend for a seminar. He and Ryan, mm-hmm. and uh, it was amazing. It was amazing. Just blew the blew the house away, so to speak. So great yeah. stuff. Awesome. Hopefully, they showed some of the stuff I showed them. <laughs> I don't know if they did, but. They showed some great stuff. Um, nice. So let's go back and talk a little bit about uh, your journey uh, through jiu-jitsu, how you got started, mm-hmm. and what that's been like. I know you uh, grew up in Hawaii, I believe. So just tell us kind of mm-hmm. how you got introduced and, and where it went from there. So um, I always I grew up around martial arts. Uh, martial arts in Hawaii is a huge thing. Uh, took judo as a kid. And it was because my mom wouldn't let me take karate. She says, I don't want you punching anybody in the face. So you're going to do judo. So she knew what it was about. So I took judo and had a great time, did it only for a little while, and then had a a period of time where I didn't do any kind of martial arts, did some wrestling in elementary and middle school. And in high school, ended up taking Kempo karate, didn't have any fun doing that. So um, I was just talking to some buddies at the gym. You know, I went back to the high school. I was in college at that time. And my high school friends, and they said, no, no, you got to try this Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. I'm like, what the heck is Gracie Jiu-Jitsu? You know, it's, you know what Gracie, you know? So <clears throat> ended up, I went and watched the video, you know, Gracie Jiu-Jitsu in action, and uh, borrowed it from the, um, give me one second, borrowed it from the library, and <clears throat> watched it, and I saw, I bumped into Helson Gracie in, at, at a club, and just kind of tapped him on the back, asked him 
if this was him, he says, yep, that's me. And I said, I want to come to your school. And he was training out of UH at the time, University of Hawaii, <clears throat> out of the, the cheerleading gymnastics room where they had a suspended mat. And that's where we did it. And that was back in 1989. And then what I did was I, all in, in addition to the Monday, Wednesday, Friday evening classes, I started taking privates in his garage. And uh, <clears throat> that's where I met Todd Tanaka, who's one of the, the OG black yes, belts yes. of Helsin. Um, and uh, <clears throat> and I didn't know that was Todd then because he was a kid. He was in middle school. Um, that's where I got my first Gracie challenge was in his garage. <laughs> uh, actually happened when I was a blue belt. And it was against a, a guy who did judo and karate. He was actually a friend of Todd Tanaka's that, that, that didn't believe this whole jujitsu thing and, and came and wanted to do the challenge. And Helsin looked at him and goes, nah, I'm not going to do it. And uh, Todd, Todd was a kid, so obviously he wasn't going to be able to do it. So he had me do it, and that was that was in May of '92 when I was leaving Hawaii for California. I got my job already, and Helson winked at me and said, "Going away, Pratt." And um, it was it was fun, you know. I was, um, you know, I had little butterflies, but because uh, first time I ever done anything like that. I mean, I'd gotten to a lot of fights as a kid in Hawaii. That's kind of a way of life in Hawaii. You just fight just for the hell of it. I mean. You know, even think about, you know, BJ Penn, right? How he'd do it just for fun. Okay. I mean, we just kind of did it that way. Um, <clears throat> but, but yeah, I, I did it. And you know, Halston didn't want me to punch the guy. He says, no, 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 no punching. You know, and he told the other guy, you know, kick my butt. You know, told him, kick me, punch me, do whatever he wants. But Ryan's not going to punch you. And I'm like, wow, that's not fair. But <laughs> turns out it was, it, he was right. And, you know, and Halston had a great influence on me. Even to this day, you know, I haven't spoken to Halston in decades, but, you know, he's still, he was my first teacher for the first, say, three years, and he's influenced me greatly. Um, after I graduated college, I moved to California, um, and I lived five minutes away from the Gracie Academy, trained there, and trained with Hoyce, Orion, Fabio Santos was there, um, Richard Brester was there, he's a brown belt, Lowell Anderson was there, uh, met Dave Kama there, Dave was a purple belt, four stripe at the time. Uh, but no Hickson. Where was Hickson? And it turns out Hickson and Horian had already um, severed ties. And Hickson had opened a studio in West L.A. That's the Pico Boulevard campus. Mm -hmm. And uh, I found it. And I, I would go there in the mornings. And so I'd go to both places. <clears throat> and then when Fabio Santos left to go down to San Diego, then that's when kind of word came down. You know, we find out that there are people training at both places. Um, you need to make a choice. So... My my thinking was, all right, if you're going to give me the ultimatum, that was Gracie Torrance, yeah. I'm going to go to Hickson's. Um, so I went to Hickson's, and Dave, you know, funny story, I found out later from Dave Kama, he got the same ultimatum, but it wasn't an ultimatum. The way Hickson did it was, uh, so uh, you're training here now, as in with Hickson. <laughs> and Dave says, Dave goes, oh, I train at Gracie Torrance too. So Hickson told him, oh, okay, so you train over there. And Dave Dave goes, oh, and, and with you? And Hickson goes, oh, so you're here now? <laughs> and Dave quickly kind of got the right. idea what was going on. So he told Hickson, no, 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 Hickson, I am with That's you. That's masterful. And, um, yeah, so he, he gave him the ultimatum without giving right. him an ultimatum, whereas I got the ultimatum and I ended up at Hickson's. And, uh, and then Dave was a brown belt. And many of you have seen that video on YouTube where Hickson, you know, he has long hair and he's, it's no gi and it's at Gracie Torrance. You can tell the green mats. Yep. And he's just running through everybody in the room. And I'm the dorky guy sitting in the yellow T-shirt. I had long hair back then. Actually, I had hair right now. I, have, I don't much have much hair on my top of my head anymore. Um, but that was the summer of 92. Um, and that was pretty awesome because Dave Kama was in it too. He was the one rolling with Hickson whose pants were untied. You see his strings kind of going all over the place. Yeah, that was that was Dave Kama. So, um, but yeah, so I, I, I was then with Hickson. Uh, was there for a while. Got my purple belt and a couple of stripes on it through him until – um, he started fighting and stopped coming around the academy. And my thinking was, I'm here for Hicks and I'm not here for anybody else. And Dave, um, comma, had moved down to Orange County and he never came up because his thinking was, if Hickson's going to be fighting, I'm not going to come up either. So he'd never come down. And back then, there's no internet, so there's no way to look Dave up. Um, and there, he was on the list in the phone book. And basically, and it's like he was trying not to be found, right? Uh, but so I ended up over at Kenny Gaberson's place after that, you know, because he was, you know, Dirty Dozen, number two on the black belt list after Craig Kukuk, who was at Gracie Torrance when I was there. Um, and so I trained with Kenny for a few years and then um, just stopped training altogether and went through a period of about 10 years where I just occasionally trained. So I, I like to tell all my students I'm the longest purple belt that I know. I was 14 years in the purple belt. Um 10 of those years not doing much. I had mats at home, but I would train periodically, but maybe in a good, in a good year, I might train five times in a year. Yeah. 
Um, and you know, and that's when uh, well, what I started were you doing? to see the shift. What were you doing during that time when you? Uh, mostly working, you know, trying to, okay. you know, trying to, trying to Just become established, a, trying to become a billionaire. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, I, hear you. I mean, no, true. I really, that's, that's really what I was trying to do. You know, I was, I was very misguided in that way and, um, didn't realize what was really important in my life. Um, but you know, people who, who kind of put jujitsu on a hiatus, um, and I tell people this, you know, we have, you know, you have that thing called the blue belt blues and people yeah. often quit during blue belt because they, you know, they, they try to transform everything in their lives for so long to get to the blue belt. The blue belt was their goal. But once you get your goal, you then relax and you no longer have anything to work for because you got your goal and you think to yourself, man, you know, this blue belt is going to be longer than the white belt. So, you know, I'm just going to kind of take a break and then end up never coming back. So, you know, we try really hard to keep our blue belts engaged so that they get to the purple belt. And I tell them, by the time you hit purple belt, you'll never quit, right? Because when I was a purple belt, I never not in my mind did I ever think that I was going to quit. It just would be that I would put other things in front of jujitsu and that I didn't train. And while I was a purple belt, I gave my cousin, Sheldon Young, um, his first lesson when I was in Hawaii. And he got his black belt before I even got my brown belt. Um, he ended up getting from Egan and Ensign in Hawaii. Um, but, you know, that's how many years that I was kind of off the ranch. Um, but in, never once did I ever tell myself I'm ever going to quit. It was all, it'd always be, okay, January, I'm going to get back to it. And then, you know, that happened ten, you know, nine more times, ten years total. Uh, then I finally got back into it and um, trained, went back with my friend, uh, Brad Jackson, who's out in Orange County, California. Uh, got my brown belt from him. And then one of my garage students found Dave Kama through a blog post that was done by Jason Selva. A number of years ago and uh, he tells me hey I found Dave and he was over at the Laguna Niguel Racquet Club which is the place that Hickson originally started back in 89 or 90 um, that was Hickson Gracie Laguna Niguel and Dave had been running it the entire time from 1993 wow. on and that from what I was told was the very last Hickson Gracie school um, and that happened I want to say around 2011 2012 and I, I went over with Dave around 2008 <clears throat> and I had to change everything around because I did re remember some stuff from Hickson, but I didn't remember everything. So Dave had to go through the process of basically making me unlearn a lot of what I already knew. And I, I kept, you know, anything that was different from what Dave did, then I had to redo it. But if it was the same, I kept it. So that process took me about four years. Um, in the 2012, you know, he, he awarded me black belt. I really didn't care. I didn't think I was going to get one. And, um, uh, but because that wasn't my objective. My thought was I was going to die a purple belt, and then I get a brown belt. And I thought, eh, I'll die a brown belt. And you know, in 2012, get a black belt. And uh, my game had entirely had changed around entirely to the point where I had actually gone back to train with Brad Jackson, my old professor prior to Dave. And he says, "Holy smokes, what did Dave teach you?" I'm like, "I don't know. I just do what he tells me." And um, you know, but that's when you have trust in your professor, where you you do that. And uh, and I, and I have that trust in Dave. I've been with Dave ever since. Um, don't see myself ever going anywhere. And I've been teaching for him um, here at the, in Dallas ever since I moved. And it was just a matter of uh, things were getting very expensive in California. And, you know, California, Southern California is one of the few places. Hawaii is the other one, probably New York City as well, San Francisco, where you can, as a family, make a couple hundred grand a year and still struggle. And, mm, yeah. and that's when uh, a friend of my wife's just said, hey, you guys got to come out to Dallas. So we went Memorial Day weekend and uh, checked it out, and we liked it. And we each made some phone calls, and um, I had uh, job offers in uh, Nebraska for one company. Uh, Nebraska, state of Indiana was the territory, uh, state of Idaho, and Pittsburgh. And being from Hawaii, I moved to Los Angeles because I wanted to go as far north as L.A. and as far east as L.A., so that's where I ended up. Um, so I, I hate the cold, and... And I told my wife that if I knew that, that if I knew Dallas would get this cold at the get go, then I just said, let's go to Florida. Um, but we ended up here in Texas. And now that I'm here, I'm probably going to die here. Um, well, it's a good place to end up. And yeah, you're right. It does get cold. Yeah, It's not known for it, but man, it, it does, uh, does get down there. <clears throat> Let me ask you real quick. You mentioned having to unlearn and it taking like four years. Uh, yeah. Talk a little more about what it was you feel like you had to unlearn and get back to what you were doing with Dave. Um, throughout that, those uh, 10, well, the year since I left Hickson in 97 to uh, when I got to Dave in 2008, um, I'd been exposed to a lot of the what we call the new style of jiu-jitsu. Um, and, you know, my first 10 years in jiu-jitsu, 
or not ten years. First eight years in jujitsu was all the old school um, Elio Gracie jujitsu, um, as taught to me by you know Halson, Hoyce, Horry, and Hickson. Um, so you know that's what I was used to, and so every time I'd, I'd you know have another instructor. You know, they'd show something and I look at that and, you know, now I start wrapping the, the gi lapels all over the place and using the, the lapels to control. I'm thinking, eh, you know, I just it just didn't look and feel right to me and I had no desire to learn it. But that stuff does kind of infect you at some point. And, um, you know, once uh, this is prior, just prior to me you know, meeting up with Dave, I was um, a friend of mine asked if we could, uh, you know, we could train at the house and he was a black belt as well. And. Um, we went, he goes, I don't have a gi anymore. So I said, okay. And while we were training, you know, and I was playing guard, he's much bigger than I am. And, uh, he would look at me and he'd slap my face. He goes, Oh, got you there. And then I, you know, I'd invert and then he'd slap me in the face again. Oh, got you there again. And I just, I, I thought, man, I go, this would not have happened to me if I was doing what I was originally trained to do. Mm-hmm. So that's where the, you know, one of the, one of the, the epiphanies I had um, came to me and thought, man, I, I have to find, you know, my thinking was I'll find Dave. That's why I told that student of mine in the garage, my garage student told him, you know, if I ever find Dave, man, I'm going to go to him. And he found him and I went. And so that's when, when I was there, I went to Dave. When I, when I went to Dave, I went, there was an open book and I said, you know what, teach me whatever you want to teach me. And I knew Dave is one of the purest Hicks and Gracie guys um, in that um, he's always been with Hickson. There wasn't a year where he wasn't a Hickson guy. And going back to 1989, when Hickson, from what I understand, Hickson came to the U.S. He started in 86 with Horian and Hoyce, but once Hickson was there, their schedules just matched, their personalities matched, and Dave's been with Hickson ever since. So since Hickson wasn't running a school anymore, I thought the the best way for me to learn Hickson Gracie Jiu-Jitsu was to have Dave do it, and I just never questioned anything he did. I just did what he told me. And it took it took a few years, and and it fixed everything. That's great. I, I did a seminar with Hickson many years ago. It was one of my kind of introductions to jujitsu, and and I ended up taking some time off later too. But it was in '96 in Tampa, and mm-hmm. it, it was um, Master Hickson, Kim was there, and uh, Master Dave was there. Mm-hmm. Uh, traveling with him so that's really yep. cool i know he's been with him for a long long time what is it about him that that drew you to him and what's been the best thing about that relationship relationship with him are we years? talking about dave yeah dave well um <clears throat> when dave and i met at gracie torrance in 92 it, you know he's he's part asian himself you know we're both part asian part hawaiian and you know you look at the guy i looked at him and i thought to myself oh another guy from hawaii so we just started talking and we became acquaintances. We weren't friends. We were just acquaintances. But I'd bump into him every once in a while and he would just smash me um, without any effort. That's that whole connection, invisible jiu-jitsu stuff. And training with him never felt it, I couldn't didn't feel like that with any other upper belt that I've ever trained with. But he'd be looking at me, smiling the whole time, you know, not like not like a haha, I got you, but smiling as in, are you okay? Are you okay? <laughs> while he's smashing me. But he would he would he would he would tap me every ten seconds, and I'd move and he'd tap me. I'd move, he'd tap me. But he would always stop and he'd tell me, "Okay, do this, right?" So he showed me how to get out of the gift wrap. You know, that's a, a big thing in Hicks and Gracie. You know, yeah, I saw this one guy put out a video. You know, seven escapes from the Hicks and Gracie gift wrap, and they were all wrong. None of them work. Um, wow. But um, but you know, Dave showed me, "Don't no, do this." I'm like, "Okay." And then, but he periodically, when I'd see him, we'd train for a bit, and he'd stop. Okay, do this. And he he was a great teacher. And um, but you know, I can't say we had any kind of bond then. Um, but you know, it's just once I came to his studio, I just realized how great a person Dave is. Very unassuming. I mean, you talk to him. Um, very very. Um, he he's quiet. Um, he's not a loud guy at all. Um, he's not a bombastic guy, um, but he's one of those guys that walks, you know, quietly, but, but, but carries a big stick and, um, and he, he's just the, he's just a great guy. Um, and you know that there's never any, that there's very little conflict in him. He hates conflict. Um, he could be upset with you and you'll never know because he doesn't want to confront you about it. Um, 
but he's just the most genuine person. You know, I'm, I'm, you know, so, you know, we kind of take both sides of the coin when it comes to running the, running the business. Um, he's, he's always the good cop and I'm the bad cop. Um, you know, everybody gets mad at me, even though I didn't do anything. Right. But that's okay. You know, if Dave, if Dave, if Dave, Dave tells everybody that I did it and they want to be upset about it, then fine. You know, I'm that guy. Um, because even if I told them it was Dave's fault, nobody would ever believe me. Um, but, but yeah, it's just, you know, and as time has grown, um, Dave is, has become one of the most important people in my life. Um, just like the way Hickson is to him. <clears throat> and hopefully, ho- hopefully my students will, will have a similar feeling toward me, but you never know. I mean, you know, it's just kind of how things happen and the relationships just develop over time and, um, some relationships become very significant and some become very superficial. That's very true. Well, how great that you have someone like that that's become somewhat of a, a mentor and a friend and such an impact on your life. So that's wonderful. I'm very lucky. There's a lot of Gracie's I could have gone to, but I would not trade any Gracie for Dave. Um, you know, it's just simple as that. You know, and I, and I do have access to Hickson, too. Man, I love Hickson. He's, he's awesome. But, you know, it, you know, being that I've, I haven't been with Hickson for a number of years and we just reconnected back in 2018, um, mm-hmm. you know, Hickson is Dave's instructor and, and Dave is my instructor. And, and, you know, I do learn, I have learned from Hickson on a number of occasions recently, but to me, it's Dave is still my instructor. Um, yeah, absolutely. But speaking of Hickson, what, what initially drew you to him and what did you find uh, the most interesting or impactful about uh, your time with him? Are we talking about in the 90s or recently? Both. Let's start with the 90s. Okay. Well, in the 90s, because I learned jujitsu because, you know, being from Hawaii, it's all about fighting. You know, you just, you know, you want every advantage you can get. And that's why I started Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. And Helson would tell it, you know, because I'd, I'd go drinking with Helson every Friday. Um, after, you know, class, we'd go home shower, then we'd meet at the clubs. And Helson would always say, he says, if not for Hickson, I would be the best in the family. Now, there are a lot of other Gracies that have said they're the best in the family. Um, but Helson, you know, and I've talked to a, several family members over the years, and Helson was one of the more fearful type of people because Helson would jack you up. Um, and that was, you know, where, and whereas they would say Hickson, there's no way you'd beat Hickson, but Hickson would be much nicer to you if you got in a fight with Hickson. Um, whereas, unless you showed total disrespect for him, like right, uh, right. like what's his name found out, Yuji Anjo. Um, but with with Helson, it didn't matter. If it's a fight, then he's going to mess you up. And you can see the, the 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 kind of restrained violence in Helson. Like if you look at Gracie in action, right? You look mm-hmm. at the, the 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 when they went up against a karate school. You had that the 14 year old kid. You had Halls, you had Helson, and you had Horian. And if you right. look at Helson's one, Helson's one, once he took that guy down, you just see those punches start flying. And yeah. when he took that arm, he ripped it. Um, He's got bad intentions. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, you know, it, it, this is a fight. So if it's a fight, then I'm going to really mess you right. up. But right. after it was done, he's giving him a big old hug, right? The kid, the other guys that kind of stay away from it, Helson, no, no, I'm going to hug you, right? Um, <laughs> but... You know, it, it, it's like that. It, I don't want to say it's, it's kind of I can't use a better word, but it's kind of bipolar. Um, right. Right. You know, if you fight him, he will mess you up. But if you don't, he's your best friend, which is why I know a lot of his black belts from Hawaii and they're all fiercely loyal to him. Um, and, you know, so so that's the type of mentality that I picked up in training. And now Hickson is the best. And when I went, the reason why I went to his school was because I wanted to train with the best because I wanted to be the best fighter that I could possibly be, even though I worked at a money management firm as an analyst and I had no intentions on ever fighting. You know, I did think about stepping into a ring, but you know, my, my rational me thinks to myself, well, you know, what if you get injured, you end up in the hospital and you got hospital bills and can't work. And, you know, and, and, you know, I was in my late twenties that time. I wasn't, I wasn't a young kid anymore. And, and that's what kept me from, you know, becoming a fighter. But at the, in the meantime, I also knew practically speaking, I'm five, four and a half. I was 135, 145 pounds at the time. And I go, yeah, you know, it's not really going to work out well for me if I end up really fighting. So I just thought, you know, just, I just want to be good. And Hickson's is where I need to be because Helson told me Hickson is the best. Right. So, you know, except, you know, if not for Hickson, he would be the best and not for, yeah, Helson would be the best. But so that tells me if I'm there with Hickson, 
I need to be there. Right. Right. And and I was. Yeah. Yeah. Coming from that source, and they're saying he's the best man. You can't really question that. I remember when the first time I saw um, Hickson, I, I walked into a gym at uh, at that seminar I told you about. It was a, on a college campus in the gym, and I walked mm-hmm. in, and someone walked in behind me, and I just happened to kind of like halfway look back. It was just this guy with a ball cap, and I did a double take, and it was him. Yep. And I was like, immediately, he just um, had this air, right? You felt not, him, didn't yes, you? Yes. Not pretentious, but confident, and you could tell, man, that's a badass, but he has this quiet, cool, calm demeanor, but you just know you wouldn't want to mess with him. But you turned around because you sensed something behind yes, you. Yes, definitely. Right? That yeah. is definitely Hickson, right? I, yeah. I, I, yeah, I was going to say S-H-I-T. I, I shoot you not. I mean, you know, that that is him. <laughs> and, you know, when I saw him again in 2018 at the Hickson Gracie Cup that he had, so that one was actually kind of an accident. It wasn't the Hickson Gracie Cup. It was, um, it was a seminar that was put on by War Tribe and it was a five black belt seminar, and the headliner was Hodger Gracie. Well, Hodger couldn't make it. I don't know if it was visa issues or something, but they go and pick up the phone, and they get a substitute. And who's the substitute? The greatest of all time. Um, and uh, that's when I decided to go. Right. So that you know, it was five hundred bucks. Right. And uh, and four four or five of my students decided to go as well. Um, I think only one of them was going to go anyway. But then once Hickson signed up, then then all of us just you know paid the money and went and. You know, that's when I met up with Hickson again, and he saw me. He looked at me like, I kind of know you. And he looked at my gi, and it says Kama Jiu-Jitsu. And he was, oh, he gave me a big hug. So you, so we, we talked later after that. But um, but it was, it was he had that same presence about him. And, um, you know, I've seen him several times since then. And every time you see Hickson, it's, there's something about him. You know, he just, he just has that, like you said, the aura around him. Yes. And, and it's, it's kind of weird, but, you know. You're in the presence of Gracie Jiu-Jitsu royalty, right? And, you know, I'm kind of geeking out on it, as you probably are since you your sure. podcast is Gracie Jiu-Jitsu Rocks. You know? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, there, <laughs> you, you geek out on it, too, which is, which is pretty it. cool. So, And plus, uh, I try not to be, you know, a hero worshiper and all that, but sometimes you just can't help it. And uh, having been a fan of his for so many years, I got to interview yeah. him um, this past year, and I was just like, wow. You know, just speaking to him was amazing, too, for sure. Mm-hmm. And, he, and he talked mm-hmm. all about his book and just his journey, and it was just awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and he's the most respectful person, yes. you know, even given what he's accomplished. And, you know, I don't know about you, but I worship no man. But, you know, I have great admiration for several men, and, yes. and Nixon is near the top of that list. So, Agree, agree. So... I want to talk about your jiu-jitsu philosophy. You've already shared that you're, you've come kind of full circle and, and really are more on the self-defense uh, focus side. So uh, I want you to elaborate on that a little bit about the self-defense aspect of jiu-jitsu and um, what do you think is missing or do you think anything is missing from modern jiu-jitsu and, and how it's evolved? Okay. So by and large, I would say 90% of jiu-jitsu on the self-defense side as we are on or on the sports side, are the same. Positions are exactly the same. Um, a lot of the concepts and execution is exactly the same, right? But with self-defense versus sport, it just comes down to what the ultimate goal is and how you train to reach that goal. So with the self-defense side, we're not just doing headlock escapes and you know hair grabs and all that kind of stuff. No, but we do do them. But we, we're even our groundwork when we're, when we're doing groundwork in you know, every class, we do a self defense concept, um, and then we do a ground concept, and then we do our drilling. But for us, it's what is the reason why you are here? Are you here so that you can learn self defense, or are you here so you can win a medal? And people who come to Kama Jiu Jitsu are here because they want to learn to defend themselves. So, that being the case. Let's say there's a thousand different things you can do in jujitsu, which there probably are, if not more than that. What we do is we kind of run everything through a screen. And the screen basically will let through the stuff that has that has zero to do with defending yourself, like inverting when you're on your guard, when you're playing guard, right? Putting your head right where somebody can stomp it or putting your head right where they can just down punch right to your face. Okay, We take that out. That falls through the screen. We don't keep it. Right. So anything that you can put into that classification that, mm, okay, it's good to do, but I have to depend on the assumption that my opponent won't punch me or kick me or elbow me in the face. 
right? If he can do that, then it gets thrown out right away. It's just a, that's a class of things that we would just throw out, right? And we will keep what would be applicable in a tournament or in a fight, right? So that's how that's where we start off with um, the self defense concepts that are in Gracie Jiu Jitsu, you know, which you do on the feet, most of them, you know, which then take you to the ground. It's the more practical stuff that, that we see. Now, we think of Gracie Jiu Jitsu as a complete art. Now, is it the best at any one thing? Eh, then you can debate that all day long, right? Um, you know, I have, a, I have a student who is, a, is an expert knife fighter, and he, he goes, you know, all the Hicks and Gracie concepts for defending against a knife and Gracie Jiu Jitsu in general, he goes, it doesn't work. And I go, what do you mean it doesn't work? He goes, well, he goes, I'd slice and dice you up. And I go, well, that's you having done years right. of Eskrima. Yes, you will. Um, he goes, and then, then you could say, well, you know, as far as the stand-up goes, you know, Gracie Jiu Jitsu guys don't know how to, they don't know how to fight stand-up. Well, that, that, that depends on how you want to put it in perspective. You know, if you're thinking, you know, we don't know how to throw a, a you know, a shin kick, you know, to, we don't know how to, you know, box or whatever, then you're right. But, you know, if you, if you do those, you know, that's great. But now the distance is all screwed up because it's about being in the green zone, which is far enough away where he can't touch you to close that distance as instantly as possible to get yes. to where you're safe again. Now, if I play, if I do kickboxing, Muay Thai or boxing, I'm now standing in the red zone yes. um, where I, where me, myself, I don't want to be being a smaller guy. You know, any bigger guy, if he lands a punch on me, I'm going to drop simple as that. You know, I don't, I don't have an iron chin. You know, I'm not like cabbage, um, cabbage Carrera, you know, who, who just <laughs> yeah, took multiple man. punches to the head. Um, that's not me. You know, you throw one punch, I'll drop, you know, I'll, I'll be Michael Bisping with Dan Henderson. Right. Um, right. so, um, but you know, so that's why I don't, I don't do those arts. Uh, but it's not this, I don't tell anybody don't learn it. I'm just saying that, you know, it'll, if your only goal is to defend yourself, then trying to do mixed martial arts will mess you up in a certain way because you, you'll, your distance management will be different and different and different. It'll never be standard. Never be, you always do this. Right. But you know, our thinking is that if we're going to do Hickson Grace in jujitsu, we're going to take everything that Hickson does. Right. And if somebody says, you know, uh, you know, so, so and so's wrestling is better. Somebody's so and so boxing is better. So and so's knife fighting is better. It's, it's okay. So what, you know, we're still going to do what we do because we would not be doing Hicks and Gracie Jiu Jitsu if we thought we were smart enough to take aspects out and put mm-hmm. something else back in, which I think is one of the big mistakes that a lot of martial artists today do because they're trying to create a new system. Right. What attracted me to Gracie Jiu Jitsu is the system of it all. Now, I am not smart enough or good enough to change bits and pieces around. Um, you know, so it, you know, Hickson was a much better fighter than I ever would be. And, you know, he's a better fighter now in his, I don't know, is he in his early 60s yet? Um, you know, I, yeah, he I is. Think so, yeah. yeah. It, he's a much better fighter in his early 60s with all the injuries he's had than I am now and that I ever was even in my prime. So why am I going to question that? I'm just going to do it exactly the way he does it. Or I'm going to attempt to, attempt to do it because. It's you know, who can really imitate him, right? It'd be awesome if there were someone who could. You know, in my view, Dave is as close as it gets. But even Dave will tell you, you know, when he would train with Hickson, he would have Hickson locked down in his opinion, and Hickson's hips would just keep moving and moving and moving and moving. Next thing you know, Hickson's on his back choking him out. Um, and this is from someone who I believe is um, one of the best, if not the best, black belt Hickson has ever produced. And, you know, and I. I just, I just, and that's one of the reasons why I kind of bonded with Dave too, is because Dave just, you know, teach me, I'm not going to question you. And I never had to tell him that. And he never, we never had that kind of conversation. I just did what he told me to do. And I did it to the best of my ability. And I still try to, Dave is always teaching me and Hickson is always teaching him. I mean, he, he goes to Hickson's every couple months, um, June or July, he was there like two or three times in the month going over some, some new police curriculum that they're developing. Um, but anytime we have questions, we ask Dave and if Dave's stumped by it, he's like, uh, I don't know. I'll ask Hicks. And then he comes back, you know, he goes, oh yeah, yeah. Hicks said to do this, this, this. Okay, good. And we, then we have our new refinements. 
Um, yeah, you know, I like how you, I like what you said about it. it's 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 a uh, you know why are you training and that's the the difference because there's there's beauty in all jujitsu of course and and I want to, I think of jujitsu as a brotherhood you know and not yeah. trying to make divisions but uh, yeah bring everybody together so to speak but at the same time you know there are differences in in um, focus and intention and and philosophy and I have heard that said a lot of times like hey. You need to add this, this, this to your jujitsu to make it complete. And it's like, well, okay, tell me why. If you if you want to be the best sport competitor in the world, then yeah, having a great wrestling tech da- takedowns, you know, or any number of things can enhance that. But if you just, you know, or if you want to be an MMA, then Muay Thai and and that kind of thing can really, or boxing can really enhance that. But fighting is different than self defense. Mm-hmm. And going back to you're saying that the red and green zone, you know. If you want to defend yourself and you're not trying to get right in there and go toe to toe with people, then Gracie Jiu Jitsu uh, has the tools and it's well rounded enough that you 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 can be good in a lot of areas. And we may, like you said, you may not be the best at takedowns or the best at this and that knives knife fighting, but it it gives you enough of it to be proficient. Um, we, we spoke a little bit about the uh, seminars last weekend with with Randy and. Um, there were some people there from different schools and some of them were like sport only and, Mm -hmm. but they knew where they were coming for a self-defense seminar. That's how we marketed it. But that was really interesting. There were some people that had been training many, many years and you could tell they've never been exposed to the stand up uh, self-defense part. And, Mm -hmm. and not just, and then some people had done the self-defense, but mainly the techniques and Randy threw in like situational awareness Mm -hmm. and it really broadened the self-defense, you know, scope, like, two people coming at you trying to flank you and you you go behind one to use them as a shield for the yep. other so, you know things like that that people had, had never even considered so i love that aspect he brought in some knife stuff and it kind of blew everybody's minds but yeah well he's got a unique background too um, for sure right and you know and, and he brings his background to enhance the art but he he does the art pretty faithfully yes. the way the way pedro teaches it and right. um you know, but people have to choose something, um, and you can't choose everything. And I think that's, that's one right. of the problems that people do is that they try to choose everything. Now, we we have students that compete. We don't have a ton of people that compete, but you know, I'm always there for them, or at least I try to always be there for them. As long as it's local, I will be there. Um, but we do well in tournaments. I mean, it's not to say that I don't have people that don't lose. I mean, every human will lose at some point in time. All right. But the point I tell my students is this. You don't need to to go to a sport school to be good in sport jiu-jitsu because the ultimate goal is to win, and you're using jiu-jitsu. And just because you don't do certain concepts that are within the rules doesn't mean that you will be unsuccessful. Um, mm. But there are certain things that you learned here in our studio that you, you learn not to do, but people will do it in a tournament. And and you know, I'll give an example. It's um, when you're when you're in somebody's guard. Um, one thing that we do is we'll just pick you up off of the ground. Well, in a tournament, they'll come right up with you and they'll have their legs around you and they'll let you carry them. And in our studio, somebody tries to pick you up, you give it up. You know, you let your legs go so you can stand up, or you let your hands go. So you can keep your upper body on the ground, but never are you in a situation where you'll be where you'll be slammed because right, right. you know it just doesn't happen. Whereas you know I watch how people just kind of let themselves get picked up, and I think to myself, man, I mean, not a good decision to make. And I know it's a sport, and you know the opponent will get disqualified. But let's say you have a full collar choke in there, you're choking the guy. He stands up and he picks you up. He has two options. Option one is to lose by letting you do this, as I call it, stupid stuff, you know, by letting yourself get picked up off the ground just so you can hold the choke. So I can lose and I can tap to your choke. That's option one. Option two is I'll just slam you and, you know, and sure, I'll get disqualified. I'm going to lose either way. Right. You know, and, uh, you know, there's a story that I had heard once and I can't remember who told it to me. And I haven't spoken to Hickson to to see if it's true or not, but. Hickson and Halls had entered a wrestling tournament, a freestyle wrestling tournament in Brazil with, uh, you know, Olympic level type wrestlers in there. And Halls had gone up against one particular wrestler and lost. And Hickson, who was on the opposite side of the bracket, 
um, had gotten to the top of his side of the bracket and was going to meet this wrestler in the championship match. And Halls, having wrestled this guy and having trained Hickson, told Hickson, uh, Hickson, this guy, you're not going to be able to beat him with the rule set that we have for wrestling. He said, so it's better to be disqualified than to lose. So when Hickson went up to the, you know, went step foot on the mat, went the guy, they get the whistle blows, they go. This is like I said, I haven't confirmed it with Hickson, and I will the next time I talk to him. He slapped him. <laughs> and then, you know, whistle blows, disqualified, and he walks off the mat. Right? So, you know, that that's Hall's telling him it's better to be disqualified than to lose. So here, you know, we're back in a regular modern day tournament situation and, you know, you got your full choke in. The guy stands up in your guard and picks you up off the ground. What are you going to do? Are you going to release it and continue to continue the match? Or are you going to chance that you're you're going to take a chance that your opponent who just picked up off the ground is going to be willing to tap and lose to that choke rather than slam you in your head? I don't know. You know, I don't like to be put in that situation. And I tell my students, I would rather you, you know, <laughs> come you know come out safe and right. lose rather than you know win by disqualification and end up maimed yeah. right that's just the way i put it to that i agree um for sure but that's the mentality that the rule book creates yes and that's the whole and it also and it always any in, inevitably any rule set um leads to people playing to that set which makes things evolve in a different way right that's um, exactly same correct. with like you know when they started adding rounds to to MMA, you know you know you can you're going to be stood up in a certain amount of time, so that affects that. Instead of knowing nobody's coming to save you, you better survive and find some way to get out of this. Right? Totally yep. different. So all that, um, and it's no different than say you're doing Taekwondo and, and groin kicks aren't allowed, so you get used to not having to worry about those coming. So you just kind of get conditioned for certain things and not others, but it's kind of inevitable. Not to pick on Taekwondo, but... So, so Ryan, who's Ryan off the mat? So what do you do when you're not on the mat doing jiu-jitsu? Do you have any hobbies, family? Tell us about that aspect of your life. Yeah, I have family. Um, married two kids. Um, one, my son, he's going to be 22 next month. Um, he's Texas A&M and soon to be a graduate, and he'll be going into the Marine Corps. Um, he's in their Corps of Cadets program, which is basically their senior military academy. Texas A&M was once a pure military school, um, and now it's a regular university. Um, my daughter, she's 17, senior in high school, and um, deciding what she wants to do. Um, two dogs, bulldogs, southern bulldogs. Um, the, not like the Georgia bulldogs, which is actually an English bulldog. You said seven bulldogs. I tell my friend from Georgia. No, no, no. I thought you said seven bulldogs. bulldogs. So, I was like, wow. You know, if you're, yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> I have two bulldogs. Uh, they're what they call white English. Yeah, they they look like American bulldogs, but they're they're what created okay. the American bulldogs. But you know, and you know, one of them literally came off a farm. Uh, but um, and what I do off the mat, I mean, jujitsu is my life. Um, you know, I, 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 I worked in financial services since 92. Um, I'll still do insurance. You know, I still do. But I, I find that as our, as our school and common jiu-jitsu is growing, more and more time goes to the school. And jiu-jitsu was my hobby. Um, it still is my hobby, but it's also, you know, my life. And I've passed on doing a lot of things because I don't want it to affect my jiu-jitsu. So I never really bothered to learn to get better at skiing. You know, Master Dave loves skiing. Um, you know, but I don't do it. Why? Because I, I saw a guy blow his knee out skiing in Park City. And you know, I saw, and funny, I met him in physical therapy after I, I blew my knee out doing judo, which, you know, I did because my son did it. I had my son doing judo and the instructor says, why don't you come and do it too? I'm like, yeah, I'll, I'll do it. And I had fun doing it, but you know, blew my knee out. And, uh, so, you know, as far as hobbies, it, my hobby is just running, running the business. Uh, that's, it's what I love doing. Um, I, you know, my, my best friends are also jujitsu, jujitsu people. So it just gives me more opportunity to spend more time with people who like doing what I do. And, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. I, I ask a lot of people that same question and, and occasionally, you know, sometimes I, I come across someone that has a whole completely different kind of hobby than, than jujitsu is, but more times than not, when you're consumed with jujitsu, um, you're consumed with it and you, it's your passion. And if you have any extra time, you do something jujitsu related. So 
<laughs> or I'm I'm out with jujitsu people. Exactly. So you know, people talk about jujitsu lifestyle. Right. Um, you know, I I truly live it, and and it's the best thing I've ever done. And you know, I I see other things I can do, and I just eh, okay. You know, will I like it more than what I what I do now? No. I mean, I love my life. I love what I do. Absolutely amazing. So. When you think back over your time, uh, had a lot of years in jiu-jitsu, training jiu-jitsu, teaching jiu-jitsu, and as you said, the jiu-jitsu lifestyle, Ryan, what's, uh, what about jiu-jitsu has brought you the most joy? The relationships that I've developed. You know, if not for jiu-jitsu, uh, most of my, my best friends, would I, I wouldn't know them. Um, I would not know Master Dave, and, uh, you know, Dave and I are very close. And whenever he's in town, he always stays in my house. When I'm in town, I always stay at his house. Um, we do a lot of stuff together, um, you know, whenever we can. And um, but you know, also my friends here and my members here in here in Texas, um, they're they're great. Like I mentioned, this big Thanksgiving drive that we're doing, baskets for veterans. They, for the most part, they participate. And and I never require them. I just tell them this is what we're doing, and it's up to you if you do it. You know, I, I backstop whatever whatever shortcomings we had. We've never had one in all the years we've done it because the members they come through. Um, when I think of people I want to spend time with, it's usually you know other than family, it's somebody who does jujitsu. Um, it's you know and the only clothes I have in my drawer. I don't wear suits anymore. Um, all my clothes are common jujitsu t-shirts. Um, <laughs> Or a common jiu-jitsu jacket or whatever. You know, it, it's right. just, I just love the art. And, you know, I don't know if you ever saw my, my vehicle. I mean, it's not like that anymore. But I had a, my, my Sequoia was wrapped with common jiu-jitsu all over. You know, nice. you would know who I am. Just wherever I, people, yeah, I, I couldn't hide from anybody. Um, but, you know, it, it's it's an old car, so I peeled it. But, but yeah, I mean, that's, it's just nothing, there's nothing better the, to me, at least, than the people that I've met doing jiu-jitsu, doing the art that I love to do more than anything. Awesome, man. Awesome. Well, what's next for you from here? Um, you know, the goal is to just teach whoever wants to be taught Kama Jiu-Jitsu and to always stay faithful to Grandmaster Hickson in what he teaches and... Um, you know, just have fun, and you know, and and I, if I if I died tomorrow <laughs> doing jujitsu, then I'd I'd have a great life. But you know, one of the most important things is I want to positively touch people, mm-hmm. and and I don't ever expect it, but I've had so many people come up and tell me, "Hey Ryan, you know the jujitsu that Kama Jitsu has has taught." And you know, what, or it's just the relationships that I've gained from Kama Jitsu has made my life better. And if I can do that for people, then to me, then I did a good job. And, you know, I get people coming up to me, mostly in tournaments, uh, but sometimes I'll get the random person, you know, out on the street that tells me, hey, you know, I, I watch your videos and, um, you know, and I really love them, which, which blows my mind because I don't think I'm an interesting person at all. <laughs> and I only started doing the videos because I'd get a new student and they want to know about, you know, what I did in the past or what Gracie Jiu-Jitsu was or any questions that I, you know, any, any answers I might have about any of the Gracie family members I talked to. I found that I was repeating myself in class and telling a story and I'd see, look at other students and the story that, you know, they've heard eight, ten times already i thought shoot why don't i just put in a video and then people can just go and watch the video i'd say you know just go to youtube channel if you have any questions and if, and if there's a question on there i didn't answer ask it and i'll do a video on it i'll answer it for you and then i'll do a video on it so other people can get that answer as well and that's how the youtube start that channel started it was just so i didn't bore my students you know having to hear a story again because <laughs> i don't think i don't think i'm a particularly interesting person um but but people watch the channel and and you know and they 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 get something from it which you know if if that's if they get one thing from it now, i've always been a type of person if i get one thing from something mm-hmm. something it's or someone it. then yeah then the time and the effort i put put into it was worth it and my life is better for it and i just want to make people's lives better if i can i want to make your life better um, and same with anybody who who i come across or people who comes across you know anything i've done and you know, I, I, I firmly believe that, um, you know, I want to have a significant life when it's all over. And I want people to go, you know, that Ryan, he made a difference in my life. Mm, 
Yes. You know, and if I can have that, then I did a good job. You know, that's why well, some I've heard somebody call it making a dent in the world. You know, if you can make a bigger dent in the world, you know, then like the bigger the better. You know. Well, I like hearing that because uh, I like hearing the stories where people, I mean, people that that don't have these intentions starting out, like I'm gonna blow up YouTube and do all this stuff. It's fine for people that do start like that, but the people that weren't even expecting it to be that popular, and they did it for reasons like you just described, but yet. It got, it's getting popular. It's gotten popular because people are benefiting and you are having impact and they can, they can feel your pure intent that you just want to, um, bring knowledge and, and help people and, and educate them. So I think that shines through. Well, and you know, look at the, look at the people that you've interviewed, right? Um, you know, the Gracie family, they're all about sharing the art. You know, there are a lot of people that, that are haters, you know, and they hate them and, I think to myself, wait, 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 you do jujitsu and you talk crap about Hori and Gracie. And I have to remind them, I go, like him or hate him, if not for him, you would not be doing jujitsu at all. Right. And, you know, or people that, you know, they'll, they'll hate on Hoist Gracie after he got beat by Matt Hughes. It's like, well, so what? If not for Hoist Gracie, Matt Hughes would not be doing jujitsu. Correct. Right. And, you know, we, anybody who does jujitsu, anybody who feels, Gracie Jiu Jitsu, or you know, they, oh, okay, they don't want to give the Gracie any credit. Call it Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, whatever, doesn't matter. Um, you you owe a debt to the Gracie family if, in fact, you are truly passionate about the art, and you've named your podcast Gracie Jiu Jitsu Rocks, like we had talked about, and it's obvious, look, seeing the title, that you you do pay homage to the Gracie family in a way. Now, you know, but you know, you've had Hickson on there, you know. Who have you, you have, have you had Hoist and Horian on too? Had both of them. Um, awesome. Hodger. Um, you have uh, Richard Bressler on? Richard Bressler twice. <clears throat> nice. He and I speak pretty often. Good friends. Um, Henner, Hedron, Clark. Lots of Gracie. Lots of Gracie. Nice. Right? Yes. So you have even a greater perspective on the Gracie family than I do. Um, you know, which is awesome. You know, that's... And, and you've been in it for a while now. I mean, you you started with that, what was it, you said 96, that, that uh, TAPA seminar? Yes. Yeah. I mean, um, and then I got the the VHS tapes from Hoist and uh, Horion and played with that. And then, then did other arts for a while because there really wasn't anywhere to, to train consistently. And they yeah. came back probably about 12 years ago. But yeah, yeah. been doing it and, for a long time. And you're a black belt now? No, brown belt, uh, two stripes. Okay. And who are you under? Pedro Sauer. Nice. Okay. You know, and I haven't met him yet. I've met a lot of his representatives, but I've not met the master yet. So one <laughs> he day is amazing. soon. Yeah. I'm, 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 I talked to Dave about maybe, you know, we might want to swing down to Brazil in February um, if, you know, we'd be allowed to. But, um, right on. but you know, that well, might I was with the I was with the Gracie Academy for years, and uh, I still um, do some training at one of the CTCs as well. So mm-hmm. I mm-hmm. show them some love as well. Oh, great. Great. Well, I'm I'm glad that you've been doing it all this time and you stuck with it. And, you know, your your hobby of, you know, doing a podcast that, uh, you know, tells of your journey and, and shares with us um, other people's journeys. It's it's phenomenal. I mean, you're doing a great job. Thank you, man. I really do uh, appreciate it. I, I'm it's my passion. Just like you. I love Gracie Jiu Jitsu. I'm going to do it forever. I'm, um, I was glad to hear that. <laughs> I don't know why, but that you're uh, I think you said 55. Yeah, I'll be 50. Well, I'm 54. Um, 54? Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm older than you, and uh, I, I, I would never have known that you're that age, which is wonderful. And I love hearing from people that are still doing you know, doing well and vibrant and passionate about the art and still on the mat as they uh, they get a few years on them. That's a, my my desire, and my uh, uh, I, I plan on being on the mat long, long term until mm-hmm. I just can't move anymore. So, mm-hmm. there you Have go. you had significant injuries? I have not. Too. I've been very fortunate. You're lucky. And, but and, yeah, I can tell you, you know, after having talked to both Hicks and, and Dave about it, you know, because the, you can tell when you see them walk, <laughs> you know that their body's been beaten up. And right. um, you know, just from watching them walk. And I remember asking Dave once when he and I were, were walking to go grab coffee on a trip in Arizona one day, you know, couldn't get a get an Uber or a Lyft. So we thought, OK, it's a mile walk. Let's go do it. And we're walking and I'm watching him walk. And I go, Dave, you walk funny. And he goes, yeah, he goes, you know, because I know it's his knees and his hips and all that kind of stuff. And I asked him, I go, 
Dave, you know, I think he was probably about maybe 57 or so. And I said, Dave, would, um, would 57, if 57 year old Dave met 25 year old Dave, would 57 year old Dave tell 25 year old Dave, yeah, you might want to think twice about this journey that you're about to start, right? Knowing the injuries and, and all the pains that you live with now, you know, and he said, absolutely not. I go, would you tell him? Would you tell him, okay, but make sure you forget about this and try not to do this and watch out for this? He goes, nope, I would, I would not say a word. Mm-hmm. And, and I go, so you'd let yourself go through all these injuries again. He says, I'd do it again. And, um, you know, when, uh, there was one time when Dave and I met with Hickson. Um, this was maybe three years ago. Um, and he said, oh, you know, because we had like a two hour private. He goes, oh, forgive me for a second. Let me kind of move. So he was kind of moving, stretching around a little bit. Mm-hmm kind of groaning a little bit. He goes, oh, you know, this body is just broken. And he goes, you know, this is my reward, you know, for, for wow. doing jujitsu. And I looked at him and he says, no, really, I really mean that this is my reward. He goes, I would not have it any other way. Man. And, and I know how much in pain he is. Um, and, uh, but yeah, and I thought about it too. I go, would I change anything? You know, because I made a lot of mistakes in my life, but you know, I am where I am today because of those mistakes, as well as because of the good decisions I've made. And, you know, my, I just had two shoulder surgeries a couple of years ago. I had them two months apart. I've had two knee surgeries. And I've had uh, a popped rib. Um, wow. And it's still out. Um, but, you know, but I've you had wouldn't trade it. And, no, never. No. I do uh, it again. I know Master Sauer has had, I think, seven, maybe eight. Shoulder seven. surgeries. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, so yeah I heard about I feel, the shoulder surgeries. I feel fortunate I've never had any major. Now, I have aches and pains and little things that are, okay, that's that's going to be with me for a while. That kind of thing, you know, and you learn to live with. So it's not like I'm 20 or anything, but but, but I haven't had to have major surgery. Um, I did I did get stabbed years and years ago before <laughs> jiu-jitsu. That was a major surgery and pulled my intestines out and checking for damage and all that. But, wow. but for jiu-jitsu, knock on wood, I haven't had to get any surgeries or anything related to it. Just mainly kind of pesky little injuries that, that nag me and that kind of thing. So yeah, fortunate, yeah. but you know what, uh, even walking funny when I do sometimes or, or having a neck thing or whatever. First of all, I, I do a ton of self care, believe mm-hmm. in that. I really invest in that. But, um, even so I look at other people my age who can't hardly even walk half the time mm-hmm. and certainly can't, be actively engaged in, in something as physical as jujitsu. And I'm like, yes, I'm doing pretty well. Yeah. And if you really think about it, the people who do jujitsu and have been doing it for decades, they're among the healthiest people you ever come across. Right. Right. Even though, you know, they've got aches and pains, but I, I tell people, when people ask me about it, I say, look, a couch potato will have aches and pains. Um, That's you know, true. It'll be different aches and pains, and it'll be stuff like, you know, they'll, they'll have diabetes, they might have liver mm-hmm. trouble, you know, depending on what they eat. And just living a sedentary lifestyle, you yes. have muscle atrophy, you know, you can't get up off of your chair without groaning. Right. Um, you know, th- we all have our issues, whether you do something like a combat, you know, activity like jujitsu, or if you don't. It's just a matter of just, you know, having a, having a, a fun ride and, you know, making sure the journey was what you looked for. And... You know, I'm, I, I admit I'm lazy like a lot of people. I'm lazy by nature. But me having to get up and do this every day for the last 30 some odd years has kept me very healthy. And, you know, and when people ask, I just tell them I, I, I can't talk enough about this. And, and it changes <laughs> exactly. it changes people's lives. Really you know, and does. one thing I tell people and maybe your, your listeners can hear this. They might have been if you're ever looking to start jujitsu and you feel you're out of shape, you know, let's say you're 30, 40, 50, 100 pounds overweight, and you tell yourself, you know what, I'd all, I've always wanted to do Gracie Jiu-Jitsu, but let me get back in the gym, let me get a better diet, because they're thinking is they're going to come into the studio and they're going to get run over. Well, they might, but what will happen is you will, that will be your incentive to do better for yourself. But I always tell students, you know what, don't wait, because if you wait, you will never come in. That's Instead, right. come in now. And we will take care of you and we will get you on your way and we will not we will protect you. You won't get run over yet, but um, but you will be better for coming in now. You know, I just need you know, I'll, I'll, I'll do the push, but you need to go along with the push. You can't fight it. 
Um, and if they do, their lives turn around. And That's even right. if they, they don't get the physical changes they, they might have been looking for, you know, they get a lot more than they ever thought they would have gotten anyway. And, and it's, if, if, you know, the best time to start is yesterday. Being that yesterday is always gone, start today, right? And if today you've already got stuff going on, then make sure you come tomorrow. And that's what I always tell people. Love it, man. That's the first way. That's the perfect way to to bring this to a close. I believe. Uh, I want to thank you, man, from the bottom of my heart for your time, your insights, and for the impact that you're having on so many people. So no, it's, I, it's my pleasure, and thank you for uh, for reaching out to me. I appreciate you. Yes, sir. Total respect and long, healthy, happy life, my friend. Same to you. Take care. Thank you, sir. All right. Bye bye. All right, really enjoyed speaking with Professor Ryan. What a class act and an all-around just great, great person. All right, this episode is brought to you by Breathing for BJJ. And Breathing for BJJ is a 31-day online video program that I spent two years in developing, and it's designed to transform your jiu-jitsu experience. You know, there's nothing more important than your breathing. It makes a profound difference in your jiu-jitsu experience. Optimizing your breathing takes your jiu-jitsu experience to a whole new level and has a huge impact on your performance. Learning to regulate your breathing can completely transform your jiu-jitsu experience. Being able to slow your breathing down when you need to, create energy when needed, breathe when in uncomfortable positions and situations, and to find the calm within the chaos are skills you need to master to create and achieve the optimal jiu-jitsu experience. This program uses a biomechanical approach to actually target and strengthen your specific breathing muscles, creating efficiency and effectiveness in your functional capacity to breathe. It's time to make breathing the foundation of your BJJ. All right, up next is the Make a Difference, Make an Impact segment. like a circuit switch once you believe you are something you actually embody it you embody that feeling if you were god forbid in a coma and you woke up and you didn't really have a memory and you were told that you used to be a navy seal and they want you back now when you're healthy do you think you'd act differently and hold yourself differently, conduct yourself different, and have a different self-concept of who you are than if you were told you were a piano instructor? Being successful in life is all about having the proper belief system in who you are, truly believing that you are something unique, that you are something special in that field. If you truly believe inside of you that you are one of the best actors in the world, you will be entirely different than if you're like, I hope I'm good. Your expressions will be totally different. Your tone of voice. You'll talk in a more convincing fashion. You'll use your natural voice instead of a scripted one. You'll be more emphatic. You'll be more real, more relatable. Our brain is like a circuit. And so if we introduce it with the proper wiring, you're going to go straight to your target. If you're unsure about who you are, then your dreams, your goals, they will never become a reality. Everyone has mental doubts in life, internal conflicts, even the most successful people that you look up to, but they don't live there. It's how you handle those negative thoughts in that exact moment and overwhelm them with positive action. And that comes with this utmost confidence in yourself that you can handle the situation. Trust in yourself that you are better than the moment. The greats think differently. The, the greats see differently, right? The, the greats have a different worldview. The greats, they, they approach the game in a totally different way. So I need you to do me a huge favor. I need you to think about what you're thinking about when your effort is low. 
Because if you can get this, if you can get this, you can get any success you want in life. You can have anything you want in life if you can get this. The next time you give a low effort, right? You give it 70% or 50% or 30%. I want you to think about what you're thinking about when your effort is low. If, if, if your effort is low, you're probably not thinking about the opportunity. You're probably thinking about the obligation. And when you think about E.T., how you stay pumped up? E.T. is how you stay on fire. E.T., how you always driven, even in the midst of trials and tribulations, even in the midst of your haters, when people try to break you and tear you down. E.T., how you stay strong? I keep thinking about the opportunity. Every single day, I'm thinking about the opportunity, and I'm not looking at this thing as an obligation. I'm not looking at this thing as something that I have to do, or that I'm forced to do, right? Something that somebody's making me do. Every time I wake up, I'm thinking, I'm alive, baby, this is the day. This is an opportunity. If you want what you've never had before, if you want to do what you've never done before, if you want to be what you've never been before, change your mentality. And I want you to see that effort goes up when you look, when you look at it as, I got an opportunity of a lifetime. But you should be excited about the fact that you have an opportunity. And that's going to do it for this edition of the show. As always, I thank you for listening. Hope you're enjoying the show. Please like and follow us on social media and help us spread the word by reposting our posts and telling others about the show. You can leave comments on the website at www.racyjujitsurocks.com. You can also go to iTunes and leave comments as well as rate the show. And we would appreciate a five-star rating, which helps us with our standing in iTunes. You can also leave comments on our YouTube channel. If you have suggestions for the show, please don't hesitate to give those. We always like feedback and suggestions. Okay, that's going to do it. So until next time, this is Marty Josie, and I'll see you on the mat.